Nehemiah 8 and 9. As we've talked about in past times, the people of God had gotten away from God. And under the leadership of Nehemiah, they're getting back to God. And they had a day where they called everybody together and they read in the Word of God for half a day. And then after that, the priest and the teachers expounded on what was read for, I guess, pretty much the other half. So this is all day service. And uh, uh, when the people heard it, they saw how far off they were from doing what God told them. And many of the people began to mourn and to cry. And it says, uh, the Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, the Levites had taught the people. They said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. Everybody say, mourn not. Mourn not. Nor weep. He said, he went on to say, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Verse 10. And then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, send portions to them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Hallelujah. Let's say that out loud together. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Hallelujah. Don't be sorry. Uh, don't, don't mourn. Don't be sad and depressed. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. If the joy is your strength, what, what is sorrow? It's weakness. Joy is a spiritual force. The joy, now we're not talking about uh, what people call happiness in the world. I'm happy because I'm eating my favorite pizza. I'm happy because I'm watching my program or my sports event. No, we're talking about the joy of the Lord. Amen. This is the Lord's joy. Amen. This is joy from Him. And the joy of the Lord is not just a state of mind. It is not, uh, the word happiness doesn't do it justice. It's much more than that. The joy of the Lord is the quickening of the spirit of life. Amen. Amen. It literally makes you strong. Yes. It's not like your strength. It is your strength. It's a force. The joy of the Lord is a force. And really, when you're experiencing the joy of the Lord, you're tasting your future. You're experiencing a little bit of the atmosphere of heaven and the kingdom of God. It's something we're going to live in from now on and not on such a low level. Heaven is full of joy, yes. full yes. of joy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The scripture says the Lord's going to wipe away all tears. There's not going to be any more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, no more death, Amen. none. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory. And that's going to be, we're going to experience that very soon. Very soon. But in the meantime, here and now, we can get a foretaste of the atmosphere of heaven in the joy of the Lord. And when you do experience it, it strengthens you. It, it, it quickens you in your spirit, in your soul, in your mind, and in your body. Amen. The proverb said, a merry heart does good like a medicine. Amen. It actually has an effect on your physical body. Amen. Well, 
On the other hand, if joy will do this for you positively, what will sorrow do to you? Sorrow does the opposite to you. Sorrow, the scripture says, works death. If something is dying, it's not getting stronger, it's getting weaker. If something's dying, it's not getting brighter, it's fading. Y'all with me, saints? Yes. Said out loud, don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. For, the the For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Is the previous verse, he said, don't mourn, don't weep. Then in verse 10, he said, don't be sorry. Said out loud, don't mourn. Don't don't weep, don't weep, don't sorrow. Don't sorrow. The, joy of the, Lord the joy of the Lord is my strength. Is my strength. Now one of the great revelations and truths is that you do have a choice. Mm-hmm. Amen. Many people don't believe it. They say, well, I'd, I'd like to be happy. Yeah. Well, I, didn't, I, I already told you we're not talking about being happy. I'd like to have this joy, but if you was going through what I was going through, you'd be upset too. Not if I obeyed the Bible. Hmm? Now all of us have come short in these areas, and nobody's pointing a finger, nobody's judging. But if we want to live the life of victory that we're supposed to live, we've got to believe first that we do not have to be depressed. We do not have to sorrow and mourn and grieve day in, day out, week after week. We do not have to. We have a choice. Now, if you believe that you are a prisoner of your feelings and a victim of your circumstances, then you're stuck. You believe a lie, and the lie will keep you in bondage. But the truth... The truth is, you've been made more than a conqueror. You're an overcomer. The truth is, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The truth is, your mind is your mind. And you don't have to think anything you don't want to think. You don't have to talk anything you don't want to talk. You don't have to yield to any feelings or emotions you don't want to. You can choose not to yield to that. And to yield to this over here. Amen. It's a choice. I know a lot of people don't believe it, but it's true. And if you believe the truth, the truth will make you free. It'll make you free. <laughs> believe the truth. Believe the truth. Go with me to Romans, the eighth chapter. Romans chapter eight. Romans eight, five. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Verse 6. For to be carnally minded, now don't let that word carnally throw you. He's still talking about the flesh. Uh, Carnal or carne, you know the word carnivore? Uh, this has to do with flesh or meat. To be flesh minded is death, but to be spirit minded is life and peace. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, can you choose what your mind is on? Yes. You can't control everything that's happening around you. You can't control everything that happens in the world or in your neighborhood, or in your state, or your city, or your country. You can't control everything your kinfolks do. Amen. Huh? Or your friends, or your kids, or grandkids. You can't control everything around you. I don't care how much faith you have. Amen. Come on. You don't have the power to control other people. God doesn't, and you can't. Amen. And if you try to control people's will through so-called prayer, 
That's like witchcraft. That's got nothing to do with God. And that can be one of the more frustrating things is that you want people to do right and do good, and it can be frustrating when they don't. Well, now you know how God feels. <laughs> I wonder if he's ever felt that way about you or something. <laughs> but uh, to be, uh, what, what does it mean to be spiritual? There's a whole lot of ideas. And, and a lot of people that think they're so spiritual, it's really laughable how carnal they are. And we don't want to judge anybody, but being spiritual is not a thing that nobody can discern. One of, one of the things about spiritual people, they don't fuss and fight. Read 1 Corinthians 3. Hmm? They, they don't, they, they refuse to get embroiled in strife. Hmm? They don't hold grudges. They don't stay bitter. Are y'all with me? That's being spiritual. Hmm? A lot of people think because they pray in tongues real loud and quote a bunch of verses makes them spiritual. But the uh, Corinthians were the tongue talking his bunch and had the most gifts of the Spirit. And, and the Spirit of God through Paul called them babies. Immature. And you can see it because of the upheaval, because of the, the strife and the fussing and those kind of things, the factions. To, to develop spiritually includes developing in love. You can't separate growing up spiritually from growing up in love. Well, it got quiet in here, didn't it? <laughs> but uh, uh, in order, something that ties right into that, in order to do that, you have to uh, discipline yourself as to what you let yourself think on. Hmm? How can you do that? How can you not get drawn in to strife? How can you not hold a grudge when people do terrible things to you? How can you not? Simple. You forgive by faith, which has nothing to do with how you feel. And then you make a choice to forget about it. Now the devil will tell you it's not possible, but he's a liar about that, about everything else. You have to choose, I'm not looking at that. I'm not going to look at it. I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to talk about it. By faith, I forgive them, and I cast the care of that over on the Lord. Change the channel. Yes. Yes. Amen. Now, if you don't change the channel, you won't be able to stay in peace, and you won't be able to have joy. If you think night and day and you talk night and day about what they did and how bad it is and how they hurt you and what they took from you, you will not be able to be victorious. You will be being carnal, Amen. unspiritual. Like I said, all of us have made mistakes in these areas. But look at the verse again, Romans 8, 5. What does it mean to be spiritual? They that are after the flesh, if you're fleshy, being unspiritual, you mind the things of the flesh. That's out here. That's the natural realm. But they that are after the Spirit, they mind the things of the Spirit. That's how you're spiritual. Verse 6, for to be carnally minded is what? Death. Death. Does it matter what you think on? How much does it matter? According to this, what you think on is a matter of life and death. I know many don't believe that, but I believe the Bible, don't you? Yes. To be carnally minded, thinking on the, the things of the natural, the things of the flesh. And if you do that, you're going to sorrow. You're going to be grieved. You're going to be upset. You're going to be hurt. You're going to be mad. And if you do that, that's the opposite of joy and peace. What's that going to be doing to you? 
It's going to be working death in you. It's going to be draining you. It's going to be causing you to get weaker and weaker and to fade. Amen. Come on. Hmm? It's the truth. Amen. To be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded, when you get your mind off of that stuff and you put your mind on him, it's like, it's like getting hold of a live wire. Amen. Hallelujah. When you put your mind on him, didn't the Bible say that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee? When you put your mind on him, a current of life flows through your mind connection into your spirit. That affects your body. That affects your emotions. That affects your mind. Does it matter what you think on? Yes. What you talk about? Yes. Is it your choice what you talk about? Yes. It is. <laughs> Go to John 14th chapter, please. John 14. Verse 1. John 14, 1 says, Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. Who's the understood subject? You are not to let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Now, what he's telling us, he was telling them, and it applies to us too, they were upset because he said he's going away. And so they're thinking on the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they probably hadn't heard anything he said for the last half a day after they heard he's going somewhere and they can't come. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. They're stuck on that. Right. And he looks at them and says, basically, stop this. Stop it. Mm -hmm. Don't let your heart be troubled. Now, a whole lot of Christians, they would say, oh, I can't help it. After what you told me. But that's untrue. Can you prevent your heart from being troubled? Yes. Can you or not? Yes. Well, the Master told us. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself. And where I am, there you may be also. What's he saying? Quit thinking about, you're not going to go right now. Think about this. Think about what's happening here. I told you, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to come back and get you. You're going to be with me. If you believe that, you can't continue to sorrow. If you continue to sorrow, you don't believe it. Just that simple. Now skip on down to verse 26. John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, John 14, 26, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I have said to you. And let you stop right there. Should you think on those things yes. that he brought to your remembrance? Yes. Should you think on what he tells you to think on? Yes. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, give I to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Can we do this? Can we do this? If my heart's troubled, why is it troubled? I let it get that way. How did I let it get that way? I chose, whether it was conscious or not, I chose to think on the wrong things, talk about the wrong things, yield to the wrong feelings until my heart got upset and troubled. Yeah. If I'm afraid, why am I afraid? How did I get that way? People say, well, so and so. They didn't know. You can't really blame them. Well, the devil. Well, you can't really blame him. They can do stuff out here, but nobody can put anything inside you unless you let it in. 
You can't control all this out here. But you can control what gets in you. In your heart and in your mind. What you choose to think about, talk about. What you choose to yield to, feeling-wise. A lot of things are real, but they're not right. <laughs> oh, the feeling is real, <laughs> but it's not right. It's not even true. How do you keep from sorrowing? It depends on what we choose to look at. What are we looking at? Go with me to Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 4. We talked last week about the Lord's house being a house of joy. We are supposed to be the most joyous people on the planet, period. Period. Nobody is supposed to be close to us in joy because unless you're born again, this joy is not even available to you. You can't get this joy. Remember what Jesus said? This joy and this peace too. Not as the world gives. You can't get this in the world. You can't get it through a pill, through a bottle, through accumulation of possessions. You, you can't get it except through the Lord. And it's supposed to be a light to everybody around about us. That no matter what's going on in our life, we still have joy and we still have peace Amen. and that the one inside us is so big and so great that nothing can steal our joy. Amen. Nothing. Amen. We might not be rejoicing about this, this, and this bad thing is happening, but we still got something to rejoice about. We're rejoicing about some good thing he told us to look at. He told us what he was doing. He told us what was coming. You can rejoice in every situation yes. about something. Yes. And that is a bright and shining light yes. to the grieving, mad, upset world around us. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Yes. 2 Corinthians 4.13. He said, We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Amen. Verse 17, for our light affliction. Everybody say light affliction. light affliction. Now did you know what Paul is calling light affliction? <laughs> being shipwrecked, being beat, being stoned, left for dead, <laughs> being in prison. He said, oh, that's just light stuff. <laughs> light affliction and it's yes. only for a moment. Worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Hallelujah. Glory to God. What are you looking at? We don't even have to know. We can see by your countenance mm -hmm. what you're looking at. Amen. That's right. Hmm? Amen. I said we can see what, by your countenance. If you're down, you're looking at the wrong thing. Period. If you're depressed, if you're scared, you've been looking at the wrong thing. You've been thinking about the wrong thing. You've been talking about the wrong thing. Yep. If you're looking at the right thing, we can tell it. Right. It shows up on your face. Amen. A glad heart makes a cheerful countenance. Amen. 
It's not a great, as, as great a mystery as some try to make it out to be. <laughs> if you're looking at the right thing, even though you may have some problems in your life, you consider it light and momentary. Amen. And the thing you're excited about is this, what you're looking at, what the Lord told you. Oh, can you say amen? amen. This is being spiritual, yes. not walking by sight, but walking by what you believe, by faith. Not being natural, carnal-minded, but being spiritually minded. And it ministers life to you. And peace helps you to have joy. Makes you strong. I said it makes you strong. Amen. He said for our light affliction. Light. The Greek on that means literally lightweight and easy to bear. Which is but for a moment. And it, this is talking about a very brief moment. And then he tells you how he's doing it while we look not at the things which are seen. Now, uh, go, you're there in, in 2 Corinthians 4. Go over to the 7th chapter and see specifically what he was talking about. He was including a lot of, a lot of other things with it. But he talks about sorrow. Neither be ye sorry. Don't, don't mourn. Don't cry. Don't sorrow. Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Well, in uh, 2 Corinthians 7 and 8, he said, though I made you sorry with the letter, I don't repent, though I did repent, for I perceive the same epistle has made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Amen. Now, that word season in the King James, to me, doesn't give the import. Look it up and you'll see what I mean. Young's literal translation says, if even for an hour. If, if even for an hour you were sorry. Verse 9 I'm going to continue reading in Young's literal. I now do rejoice. Was Paul, did he practice what he preached on this rejoicing thing? Yes, he did. Yeah, he did. Yes, he did. Have you read Philippians? Yes. Yeah. Where it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I mean, there's rejoicing on every chapter. Yeah. He's in prison. Yeah. <laughs> and he's telling everybody, quit moping around. Rejoice! Rejoice! <laughs> you're not rejoicing about the condition of your cell, but you're rejoicing that you're in the plan of God, Amen. that the Word's going out, Amen. that His will, you're going to be out of here in just a few, few minutes, God time. This is just a brief, light thing. May not feel like it, but it is. But you were made sorry to reformation, or the King James says repentance. For you were made sorry toward God, that in nothing you might receive damage from us. Now you'll see he's distinguishing between two kinds of sorrow. It's very important that we get this. So we say, well, sorrow, sorrow, isn't it? Absolutely not. There are two very different kinds of sorrow. Read the next verse. For sorrow toward God, reformation to salvation not to be repented of does work. Now that's Young's literal. It doesn't, doesn't read that easy. But he's saying, um, we'll put the King James up. We'll read it that way. Godly sorrow works repentance to salvation not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world works death. If you miss God, you violate light, you do what you knew you shouldn't have done, you don't do what you knew you should have done, and your, your own heart, the Spirit of God convicts you, your own heart condemns you. Did you notice how I said that? The Holy Spirit's not condemning you. That's your own heart doing that. If you care, it bothers you. Hmm? And you're sorry about it. 
Now, there's, there's some will try to tell you, yeah, but under grace, we're not supposed to be sorry about anything. That's absolutely wrong. There's two different kinds of sorrow here. If you don't even care that you miss God and displease God, you're not repenting. Come on, can you see this? But this is only supposed to last this long. Are y'all with me? And, and you mean business with God, and you're sorry that you missed it, and you receive your forgiveness. Is that right? And your cleansing and your righteousness is restored. And you don't go on day after day sorrowing. I said, you don't go on. And that's what he's telling them. He said, you're, if, you don't, if you don't stop doing this, you're yielding to something else here. Not a godly sorrow to repentance. You're yielding to the sorrow of the world. And that works death. Oh, can you see the contrast here? The joy of the Lord is your strength. Where's that coming from? Life. It's life and strength. But the sorrow of the world, what does that do to you? It works death in you. I said it works death in you. Is it okay to sorrow and grieve and mourn day after day and week after week and month after month? It's being an unbeliever. I said it's being an unbeliever. It's refusing to walk by faith. It's choosing not to believe the word. Is choosing not to do what the Lord told us to do. Hmm? You, well, I'm, you know, I, I want to prove how sorry I am. The Lord knows your heart, whether you were or where you weren't. Well, I just feel like I need to, pay, you know, pay some kind of penance. You're acting like the blood of Jesus is not enough. These are serious things. No. Relationships have been destroyed because of this. Families have been torn apart. Careers have been destroyed. Because people have chosen to mope and they've chosen to be sad and depressed and it's got worse and worse and worse as the days and weeks and months went by until people around them said, I, I can't live with this. And you can't really blame them. Well, I can't help it. That's a lie. That is a lie. Now, if you yield to it for a long time, it will seem like you can't help it because you've yielded to it so long and so far that you do it without thinking. You're used to being sad. That seems like normal life to you. But that's not being a Christian. A sad, depressed Christian is a contradiction of terminology. Amen. <laughs> the Christ is the anointed one. And one of the things he's anointed with was the oil of gladness above everybody that was around him. This, this uh, part of the master, this, his character has not been portrayed even remotely as much as it should have been. Jesus was fun to be around. He was enjoyable. Somebody said, well, he's the man of sorrows for about that long. When he went to the cross, when he was in the garden sweating blood. But all the time before that and all the time after that, no. No. Let me tell you one of the reasons you can know for sure he wasn't some grouchy guy. Little kids loved him. They loved to be around him. Little kids don't enjoy being around somebody that acts all scary and all sad and all depressed. They want to get away from that and go somewhere and have fun. Right? But the little kids were drawn to Jesus like a magnet. Weren't they? They loved to be around him. Why? Because he is joy personified. Because that's who God is. This darkness, this heaviness, this depression, it's not God. It's not being spiritual. I've seen people supposed to be praying.
close up, shut up, and for days. And when they come out, there's a cloud of depression on them. That's not prayer. Amen. <laughs> That's not prayer. Amen. That's wallowing in wrong things that the enemy brought to your mind. Yeah. Amen. Hmm? If you got faith, you're going to have some joy. Yeah. You're going to have some peace. Yeah. You're going to have some strength about you. Yeah. There's going to be some life about you. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you hadn't been there, don't despair. Mm -hmm. You can come up. Yeah. You can come out. It's a choice. Yes, it I said, it's a choice. Yeah. Say it out loud. Don't, don't mourn. Don't cry. Don't, cry. Don't, be Don't be sad. Don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. The, joy the, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 It's not something you have to work up. It's not something you have to beg God to give you. You just have to make a choice to quit thinking about all this other stuff. Yes. Quit yes. talking about it. Quit yielding to it. Yes. And look unto Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. If you're really seeing him, yes. it's going to put some joy in you. It's going to put some peace in you. Yes. It's going to put some strength in you. Yes. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. Somebody say glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Have you heard Brother Jesse DePlanis talk about his... Uh, heaven experience that he had. One of the things that he talked about that just really stood out to me, and I'll share it with you and hope I get it right. I, I think it's, it's pretty accurate. Maybe you can listen to him account it sometime, see more detail. But um, He said he saw Paul. Paul. The one we're reading his writings about. <laughs> he saw Paul. And, and some others, but we won't talk about Paul. And uh, he said he, uh, he was so elated. He said, he said he told Paul, he said, I preach everything you said. I preach all your stuff. <laughs> he, said, he said, you know Jesse. I mean, he just, he, and, and he said, uh, he said Paul was pl so pleased with it and, and talked to him. And uh, uh, here's an interesting thing. He said, Paul said, he said, one of the most amazing things to me, Jesse, he said, is I, when I was writing this, you know, I mean, I'm paraphrasing now, uh, he knew the Lord was using him, but I'm quoting, I believe, directly now. He said uh, that God made my words his words. See, I mean, this is just me talking now. He, I'm sure he was aware God was anointing him and directing him, but he wasn't aware, apparently, that he's writing half the New Testament. And that sounds right because that's how God leads you. He just leads you by faith. He's not going to tell you everything that he's doing. And then he said, uh, before Jesse left, he said, Jesse, I want you to, to tell folks this. And he, quoted, he quotes this scripture uh, that, we, that you and I just read in, in 2 Corinthians 4.17. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. He said, Jesse, tell people, they've made it a lifetime of affliction. He said, tell them, take it back to a moment. I think that's very significant. Many are, they're way too serious. And they're joyless. And they think that's all right. They think they're spiritual. But it's just not true. When you're spiritual, even if it's something significant, you count it light and momentary, and you don't let it get your joy. He said, tell them they've made affliction a lifetime of affliction. He said, take it back to a moment. A moment. 
So many things in people's lives that should have been a moment has become their life. They won't let it go. They won't turn loose of it. They won't quit thinking about it. They won't quit talking about it. It should have just been a moment. Something had happened, something it's over. But they relive it every day. When it's not happening, it's over long ago, but not in their mind. Look with me. Again in, in Genesis. Nineteenth chapter. When God was delivering Lot and his family, he supernaturally moved because of his covenant with Abraham and because of the prayer and the intercession to save them from what was going to destroy all those cities and all those people. And in Genesis 19:17, it says it came to pass when the, they brought him forth abroad, the angels brought Lot and his family, his wife, his kids. Escape for your life. Look not behind you. Everybody say, look not behind you. Not he said, neither stay in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest you be consumed. Everybody say, look not behind you. Look not behind you. Now, why would he say that? Why would he say, don't look behind you? Don't look, because whether they know it or not, all that's history. It's gone. It's done. He said, don't look behind you. Verse 26, but what happened? But his wife looked back from behind him and became a pillar of salt. What did she do? She looked back. Well, now, when the Lord tells you don't look back, should you treat that as just a nice idea, optional? When the Lord says don't look back. Hmm? Now, a lot of people would try to say, well, man, when you're hearing all the commotion and all the destruction and, and who knows what all, how could you help not looking back? Well, it's your choice. They didn't, Lot didn't do it. The other ones didn't do it. She did. And when she looked back, what should have been a moment in her life became the rest of her life. Can you see that? Looking back can freeze you in time. And her family went on without her. Life went on without her. Can you see this? Went on without her. Yeah, but you don't know what they did to me. It's history. Yeah, but you don't know what happened. It's history. Isn't it? Well, I can't help but think about it. That's a lie. That is absolutely a lie. You choose to think about it. Somebody said out loud, my mind, my mind is my mind. Is my mind. I, have I have the mind of Christ. That means I don't have to think on anything. I choose not to think on. Didn't the Bible say, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ, bringing into captivity every thought. Can you do it? Yes. Well, obviously we can. It's, it's, it's a fight. It's a battle. Every day things are vying for your mind. There are many voices in the world. But when she decided to look back, when the Lord told her don't look back, what should have been a moment in her life became the end of her life. The rest of her life. And she couldn't go on, could go no further, was frozen in time, immobilized. 
Nobody has to do that. But millions have in some form or fashion. Somebody say, by the grace of God, I will not look back. I will not sorrow. I will not mourn. If you're looking back to the problem, to the destruction, to the failure, you're not going to have any joy. You're not going to have any peace. But if you're looking forward, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. the path of the just gets brighter and brighter. If you're looking forward, he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. If you can't think of anything else to shout about, you can shout about that every day. Is that right? But there's a whole lot to shout about in this life. The rest of the plan of God. But you can't move forward looking back. You can't see your healing looking at the symptoms and at the bad report. You can't see your, your needs met looking at the bills. You can't see the miracle looking at the problem. Hmm? You can't see your forgiveness and righteousness looking at your mistakes. It's a choice not to look at the things that are seen. Not to be carnally minded, but to be spiritually minded. It's a choice. I said, it's a choice. I'm looking at healing. I'm looking at my needs met. Hmm? I'm looking at me being made clean by the blood of the Lamb. Totally righteous, totally accepted by God because of what Jesus has done. Right? That's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at following, finding his will, following his plan, finishing my course with joy. Joy helps you to finish the course. It takes strength to run your race. What gives you strength? I can't afford, I cannot afford to be depressed two hours. Amen. Come on. I can't afford it. It's not like I got all this extra strength I don't need. I can't afford to dwell on bad things that happened or dwell on the past. I can't afford that. Nor can you. Nor can anybody. Hmm? Once I know what has happened, do what I know to do about it, and then what? Cast the care over on the Lord. I've got to get my mind on something that's going to help me come out of this. Yes. Right? Yes. I've got to focus on Him. Yes. Looking unto Him, yes. author and the finisher of my faith. Yes. Glory to God. Somebody say, Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Look at Psalm 30, please. Psalm 30. I know all of it may not be enjoyable, but this is good preaching. <laughs> it is. Acknowledge the truth. Acknowledge that all the days you were hurting and sorrowing and grieving and days and weeks, you did not have to go through that. I said you did not have to go through that. Now, if you weren't a believer and you didn't know God, well, okay. You didn't know. Of course, you could have probably received Jesus a lot earlier than you did too and still skipped it and missed it. But especially as a believer, hmm, going through all this torment and vexation, sure, things are going to hit you. You're going to feel it in your soul. Thoughts are going to come. Feelings are there. They're real and they're strong. Amen. But it's still your choice whether I look back and am frozen in time, hmm? whether I look back and become immobile and become so unpleasant to be around. Hmm? Well, they need to understand and give me time. Said who? How much time do you need? Well, my psychologist said I'd probably take about two years. And where did they get that? Why not a year and a half? Why not four? Where'd they get that? 
Just because somebody wrote a book and has got letters at the end of their name does not mean they're right when this says something else. Come on, are you with me, friends? No. There's no excuse. There's forgiveness. There's healing. But there's no legitimate excuse for staying depressed and staying down and staying bitter and staying hurt. Maybe some ignorance. But if that was the case, shouldn't be after tonight. Shouldn't be after tonight. Come on, somebody. Besides all that, for you, it's no fun at all living that way. Is it? What good does it do? You think you're the only person something bad happened to? Only ones ever had to deal with any challenges? Everybody has things to deal with. This is the earth. It's full of the curse. Devils and crazy people. <laughs> Every day is a new adventure. <laughs> oh, but don't believe you are limited to acting as a mere mortal. You are a born again child of the living God with the greater one on the inside of you. And you don't have to allow these thoughts and these feelings to oppress you and rule you and run your life. You can have joy in the middle of anything. You can have peace in the middle of anything. And the joy of the Lord is your strength. I mean the moment you begin to yield to that joy and express that joy, weakness begins to go away. Strength begins to come in you. Why do you think the Lord said, rejoice all the time? I'm telling you again, rejoice all the time. Rejoice all the time. Rejoice all the time. Can you rejoice about something all the time? I mean, if you can't think of anything else, you can just go, my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Woo! Hallelujah! 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 They're working on my mansion right now. Wow! We, glory to God, glory to God, I'm not going to hell. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! I'm not going to hell. You don't have to look too hard if you're willing to find something to shout about. Hmm? It's a choice. You can look at this, stay down, or you can look at him and come up. Psalm 30, are you there? Psalm 30. The Spirit of God anointed uh, the psalmist, and this came out. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not made my foes to rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried unto you, and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Sing to the Lord, O you saints of His. Give thanks at the remembrance of His holiness. For His anger endures but a moment. Everybody say, just a moment, just a moment. In His favor is what? Life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Don't you let it go day after day. Everybody's going to, you know, have to deal with some things and some feelings and situations, and and they're going to be strong. They're going to be real. You may cry. You may feel sad about it, but you got to make up your mind. I'm not staying here. I'm not staying here. I'm not staying here all day long. I'm not st- much less a week or a month or anything else. Somebody say, joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning. Hallelujah. (laughs) 
But it ain't all that long from night till morning. In my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by the favor, your favor, you've made my mountain to stand strong. You did hide your face. I was troubled. I cried to you, O Lord. To the Lord, I made my supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise you? Shall it declare your truth? Here, O Lord, have mercy upon me. Lord, be my helper. You've turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. Oh, somebody say, you turned for me my mourning into dancing. You've put off my sackcloth. So that's what people wore when they're mourning and grieving. And you've girded me with gladness. Hallelujah. I got the garment of praise instead of the spirit of heaviness. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I refuse to wear depression clothes. They're out of fashion and they are ugly. They're ugly. I refuse to wear dull, drab, dark. We're dressed in something. And I'm not talking about what you got on physically. You're dressed in something. The Bible talks about the garment of righteousness, doesn't it? And we're talking now about the garment of praise. Well, a garment is something you put on. You put it on. I said, you put it on. Someone said, yeah, but I'm not a put on. (laughs) I'm not going to act. If I don't feel glad, I'm not going to act like I feel glad. (laughs) No, sir. I'm real. (laughs) Got real carnal. Everybody say, put on on. the garment garment of praise. praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come here, brother. Come here and help me out just a minute. Take your coat off. Okay. (laughs) Let's turn around and face these folks. Now, let's say he says, man, I'm cold. I'm cold. Wish I wasn't so cold. And I say, well, here, brother. Put your coat on. And he says, no. I'm not a put on. I'm not a put on. I mean, if I'm cold, I'm just going to say I'm cold. (laughs) Well, yeah, I know, but put your coat on. No, I'm I'm not a put on. (laughs) If I feel cold, I'm going to say I'm cold. Well, I know it, but if you'll put this on, you'll start warming up. No, but I, uh uh-uh. No, I'm just real. And I feel cold, and that's what I am. The scripture says in the New Testament in Ephesians, put on the new man. Didn't it say that? Somebody say, put on, put on. How do you put it on? Well, let's say I got him to put one sleeve on. Now, just stop right here. Is he instantly warm? Does he instantly feel warm? No, no. But if he'll go ahead and put it on, what what immediately begins to happen? He begins to feel a little warmer. Is that right? I'm not holding it right for you. (laughs) And he, and he he puts it on. He's not instantaneously completely warm, but if he'll keep it on after he's put it on, he'll start feeling warm. Is that right? The feeling comes after he puts it on. You can be seen. Glory to God. You have to put on praise before you feel all joyous and strong. It's when you're weakest, you need to put on some praise. A lot of people, you know, if they don't feel a certain way, they put on some music. Helps get them thinking in another vein. Huh? Huh? Put on some praise, put on some thanksgiving, and even when you felt lousy, after a little bit, your feelings going to start changing. Yeah. You're going to start warming up. Yeah. 
Oh, somebody say glory to God. Glory to God. I'm a praiser. I'm a worshiper. I'm a thanksgiver to God. No matter how I feel. No matter how I feel. Feeling has got nothing to do with it. That's not based on feelings. I do it because it's right to do it. I do it because I believe it. I do it, I do it because I choose to. Other folks are choosing to cry, feel sorry for themselves, try to drown their problems in a bottle or with a pill or whatever the case might be. I refuse to do that. Yes. I said, I refuse to do that. Yes. Number one, it doesn't work. Yes. No, I refuse to do that. I know something that will actually help. Yes. Read it again. What did he say? Psalm 30, end of the verse here. Verse 11, said out loud, you have turned from me, turned from me. my mourning, my mourning. Into, dancing. into dancing. You've put off my sackcloth, off my sackcloth. Girded, me girded me with gladness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't wear the ugly spiritual clothes. <laughs> ugly, stinky, of depression and sorrow and Bitterness day after day, week after week. And certainly don't cause it, call it spiritual. Put on the garment of praise instead of the spirit of heaviness. Put on gladness. You don't have to feel it. Put it on by faith. And watch things begin to change. He said, to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent, O Lord my God. I will give thanks to you forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You get up thanking the Lord and you go to bed thanking the Lord. You get up praising God and you go to bed praising God. You praise God when you feel good. You praise God when you don't feel good. You give thanks when things are going good. You give thanks when things are not going good. In everything, in every situation, you give thanks. You give thanks in your good clothes. You give thanks in your pajamas. You give thanks in the bedroom. You give thanks in the kitchen. You give thanks in the car. This is how you live. It's how you live. And when you're tempted to fear, the Lord said, don't let your heart be afraid. When you're tempted to be troubled and upset, the Lord said, don't let your heart be troubled. Didn't he say it? How are you going to keep from letting it be troubled? How are you going to keep from letting your heart be afraid? How? You got to choose to look at something else. You got to choose to think about something else. Talk about something else. Do something else. Can't just sit there. Got to choose. Now, go with me to 1 Samuel 15, and I want you to notice this. Situations can be heart-rending. I'm not, I'm not saying all of this is all, always easy, but it is the right thing to do every time. And it especially can touch you when it's people that you care a lot about and things go the wrong way with them. Yeah. That can touch you. And you can be sorely tempted to let that eat away at you and chew on you and you sit around and think about the problem and hash it and rehash it and rehash it. And if you do, you're going to lose your joy. You're going to lose your peace. You're going to lose all your strength. You're not going to be in faith. Nothing's going to get better. Hmm? And if you say, well, I just can't help it. It means too much to me. You're believing a lie. Amen. But I want you to notice something, how, what the Lord told his man in this situation, how to deal with just this kind of situation. In 1 um, Samuel, let's see, <clears throat> 15, the end of the chapter, down about verse 35. Saul was, you know, the, the prophet Samuel anointed Saul to be king. He, he's the one that heard from the Lord and, and called him out and, 
and told him about the kingdom. And I mean, they, they, they had a relationship there. But Saul was rebellious and wouldn't listen to the Lord. And, and he didn't learn his lesson after missing it time after time after time. He was so proud and so hard-headed. And eventually, because he was so disrespectful of God and Samuel too, the Lord told him, he said, uh, the kingdom's taken away from you and is given to somebody better than you. Talking about David that nobody knew about yet. And uh, Samuel mourned for Saul. He grieved for him. It bothered him. It hurt him. Samuel came no more to see Saul till the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he made Saul king over Israel. Now, these are statements most Christians don't even believe. What does that mean the Lord repented that he made Saul king? We might, it's not really an accurate, accurate word, but we might say regret. He, the Lord was displeased. What, what do you mean? How could that be? Because people really do have a free will. Amen. They don't have to do even what the Lord wants them to do. This is just a fact. We talked about that earlier. He's not going to make them do something, even if it destroys their life. And if he won't, you shouldn't try. Amen. You can't. But nor do you just mourn about it. That's what Samuel's doing. And in the, the 16th chapter, the next verse there, I guess, the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I've rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. <laughs> Quit grieving. Quit mourning. Get it off your mind. Fill your horn with oil and go. Somebody say, fill your horn with oil. Does that sound like sad or glad? glad. This is anointing. And go. We know reading the rest of the chapter, he's going to show him the next king, and this be the king that everybody talks about David and the exploits and all the amazing things that happened. And still to this day, he's talked about over and over and over again. You can't control Saul, Samuel. I've made a decision. Because he made a decision. And you got to get this off your mind. How long you keep doing this? You need to move on. You need to fill your horn with oil. <laughs> Somebody say, fill your horn with oil. And go. Is that not the opposite of hanging around, crying, feeling sorry, feeling sad? You're not the Lord. You're not the judge. You're not responsible for all their decisions. You can't change everything just because you want to. And being sad and depressed, all that's going to do is keep you looking back and keep you frozen in time and keep you from finishing your course. It's a trick of the devil. People think it's noble because it's because I love them so much. That's no excuse for ignoring God. Amen. Hmm? But I just, I just can't keep from thinking about it. Another lie. It's a choice. Amen. You have a master. Amen. You have a course to complete. Amen. You have a job to do. Yes. Sitting around grieving about them. Replaying everything. Amen. Is a trick of the devil to prevent you from moving forward. You need to be a vessel filled with oil. Amen. And you need to go. Hmm? As a pastor, as pastors, Phyllis and I, 
We've been involved in a lot of situations over the years. A lot of heart-rending things. We've had minister friends that just missed it. Quit God. Quit the ministry. Good friends. A lot of things that hurt you, bothered you, pulled on your heart. But if I, if I hold on to any of that, it's going to hinder me from ministering to you. Hmm? If I'm carrying around this grief and sorrow and sadness, it's going to contaminate what's coming through this vessel. Come on, can you see that? It's going to affect the people I'm around. Hmm? Even though I might try to put on a good front, it's in me. It's there. There's always that darkness. There's always that sadness. Amen. And you hear people say stupid things. Well, we're all damaged goods, and we all have a lot of baggage, and we all just have to accept either each other's baggage. I ain't accepting my baggage, <laughs> much less yours. Ah, <laughs> uh, no. You can let it immobilize you. Turn you into a pillar of salt. Keep you from moving on. And I can't control that. And I won't be glad about that. But I'm not going to dwell on it and let it stop me. Because that's another trick of the devil. Instead of stopping one, now you stop two. No. 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 By faith, I can cast the care of the, that over on the Lord. I know he's good. I know he's merciful. I know he's faithful. And if things I don't understand, I can, I can just give it to him. I say, here, Lord, I'm giving this to you. I'm trusting you. I'm asking you for mercy and on this. What do you do? Okay, now what do you do? He said, Samuel, why don't you keep mourning over this? Quit this. Fill your horn with oil and go. <laughs> there is kingdom business to be done. Is God fair or not? Saul had his opportunities. He had multiple opportunities. He was just too rebellious, too stubborn, too disobedient. Wouldn't do it. God ain't going to make you. You get to a certain point, train's going to leave without you. Right? right? Yeah. God here, use somebody else. Yep. But if you let it bog you up, and if you hold on to it and you grieve year after year and month after month, all, it's not going to change anything with them. It's not going to help them or that situation, but it will freeze you in time. It will immobilize you and could likely destroy your relationships because nobody likes living with depression. And nobody should have to. No one should have to. Say it out loud. Don't be sorry. Don't cry. Don't mourn. Don't mourn. The, joy the, the joy of the Lord is, is my, strength. my strength. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stand up on your feet.